Now, as I thought about the message that I want to give today, and having just finished a 15-week study in 1 Peter, last week we finished that series. And of course, 1 Peter is all about dealing with persecution. Peter writes to people who have had to scatter from their homes because of government-sponsored persecution in the first century. And because of that, I want to talk to you this morning about the importance of staying faithful to Jesus no matter what. No matter what may happen, no matter what may come, we need to stay faithful to Him. As you know, we are living in uncertain and difficult times. Uh, Who knows where the future is going to take us? More and more, the culture of our day is turning against Christianity. It just is. The secularism of our day is turning against it. Like in the first century, more and more Christians are being viewed as a threat and as a disturbance to the prevailing worldview. And so, how should we respond? What should we do when the heat comes our way? And my encouragement to you today, my challenge to you is no matter what may happen, stay faithful to Jesus. He stayed faithful to us when He gave His life there on the cross 2,000 years ago. And now our opportunity is to stay faithful to Him. Now, because this is Halloween, I want to talk to you first of all, before we get into staying faithful, I want to talk to you, uh, give you a brief history of how we even came to celebrate Halloween and why this day, and we'll talk about that. I want to get, share with you facts, some facts, five facts that you need to know about Halloween. So if you've got a pen or pencil, please follow along here because this was insightful to me and helped me understand just what this day is all about. The tradition to celebrate October 31st, and you say, why that day? Well, the tradition began with the ancient Celtic festival, think of the Druids, and the festival was Samhain, Samhain, when people would light bonfires and wear costumes to ward off ghosts. The Celtic or Celtic people lived in England and northern France, primarily. October 31st, traditionally, why that day? Well, traditionally it marked the end of summer and harvest time and the beginning of a cold, dark winter. Think of the northern people. So October 31st marked the transition day between these two. The Celts believe that on that particular day, the boundary, now this is important, the boundary between the worlds of the living and the dead were, were blurred, and the ghosts of the dead would return to earth. In Mexico, they call it the Day of the Dead. You probably have heard of that. Latin America also celebrates that Day of the Dead, although in Latin America, Mexico, they celebrated on November 2nd, the Day of the Dead. But it's all this idea that at this critical time, the worlds between the living and the dead get blurred, and the dead can come and visit, visit families, visit their friends, visit whatever. In the 8th century, that's the 700s, Pope Gregory designated November 1st as All Saints Day. It was a time to honor all those saints who had stayed faithful to Jesus, especially those who gave their life for Christ. The evening before was called All Hallows' Eve, All Saints' Eve. And it's where we get our name, Hallow, Saint, Halloween, Eve. And why it's celebrated in the evening, on the evening of All Saints Day. It is an evening event, Halloween. Today, Halloween is celebrated by most of us as a fun time for kids, families to get dressed up in costumes, and to get lots and lots of candy. But folks, I want to just caution you that we should always remember and be mindful of the pagan roots associated with this day. And stay away from what I would call the dark side of Halloween. In some Latin American countries, this is when the practice of voodoo is at its worst. In our own country, this is when witches celebrate this day. 
There are animal sacrifices, dogs, cats, sheep, horses, whatever. Animal sacrifice is going to be offered by some this day. There is an evil occult side to Halloween. I talked to one retired law enforcement officer who said when he was serving as an officer, uh, he hated this day. It seemed like Halloween gave license to people to just do crazy, stupid things. So, my final point is, we need to understand that it's a cultural thing here in our country, and it's something that we celebrate and involve ourselves with as a culture, but we need to stay away from the dark side of it. Demons are involved and will get involved if you get involved in the dark side of Halloween. I would be remiss as a pastor from warning you of that. Be careful how deep and how far you want to go in the dark side of this day. Do not be naive in thinking there aren't demonic influences associated with it. The Apostle Paul talked about pagan practices in the first century. And even though we know there's no idol, there are demonic involvement when you participate in that idol ceremonies or service. And so he warned in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 19 through 22, the demonic influences that are often associated with pagan practices. So yes, have your fun, but be mindful there is an evil associated with this day. And some people take it too far and get involved in the occult, occult aspect of it. Well, now that I've scared everyone, let's have some fun this evening, okay? But seriously, because Halloween is such a big part of our culture, we as a church embrace this, the innocent and fun part of this day. We always have. But we certainly don't endorse the dark side of Halloween. We don't endorse the satanic part of this day. We just don't. I know that some of you maybe here don't want anything to do with Halloween. Maybe because of past association, things you've read and become convinced of, and that's fine. We respect that. But for most people, it's a time to get dressed up and have fun and get a lot of candy. I'm thinking of the kids now, uh, to have a lot of candy. My, uh, our two granddaughters uh, are so excited about this evening. One is going to be Batman, and the other one's going to be uh, one's going to be Spider-Man, the oldest one, Everly, and Maisie, the two-year-old, is going to be Batman. So watch for their little outfits. They're so cute and so excited about it. We understand the innocent part of it. I believe that it's one of those doubtful things that we live in today that we can participate. Much like Christmas has some pagan roots, and yet we still celebrate Christmas, in this way we can still have some fun, but keep it innocent. That's my warning. That's my encouragement to you. Don't get involved in the dark side. Well, now that we've talked about that, and tomorrow is All Saints Day, I want to talk to you a little bit about those believers in the past, and even today, who have had to give their lives because of their faith in Jesus. You know, Jesus warned us when He was here on earth that if you decide to follow Him, it could cost you. It could cost you dearly. It could cost you with your friendships, with your employment, with your advancement in life, and it could even cost you your life. I want to give a few verses here to remind us of what Jesus said. In John chapter 15, verse 20, Jesus said, If they persecuted me, know this, they will also persecute you. This world will not always favorably receive Christians. In some way, we Christians here in America have been a, in a wonderful parenthesis of this natural, normal trend of persecution. For 200 and some years now, for the most part, we have been spared this. I think that day may be coming to an end. Jesus also told us in Matthew 10, verse 28, Do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, we need to fear God more than we fear man or any governing of power or authority. And then Matthew 10, 32 through 33, Jesus said, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, before authorities, 
I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, before authorities, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. These verses become extremely important when you understand the persecution that occurred in the early church. People lost their lives simply because they would not renounce Jesus. They would not deny their Lord. And so, I want, that brings me now to two passages in the book of Revelation that I want to share with you. Both of these passages deal with being persecuted and dying for your faith. The first passage is Revelation 6, 9 through 11. John the Apostle is giving us a glimpse of heavenly things in Revelation chapter 6, 9 through 11, and this is what he saw. Verse 9, when the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the Word of God and because of their testimony which they had maintained. In other words, they did not deny Jesus. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, how long will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on this earth? In other words, how long, Lord, must we wait before justice comes to this earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, which represents Christ's righteousness. And they were told that they should rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. Now what the final tally of this number will be, we have no idea. But certainly know this, that before Jesus comes, that number is going to grow. Count on it. Those who have died for their faith. This brings us to the second passage in Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 through 12. Notice what is told there. John again has a glimpse of heavenly things. In verse 10 he says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ has come. For the accuser, that's Satan, of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. And they, the believers, overcame him, Satan, because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he only has a short time. Satan is on borrowed time. He has just a short time to harass Christians and Israel, always with a focus on Israel as a nation. And it's going to get worse the closer we get to Christ. Count on it. But notice, I love this, notice how we defeat the devil. How do we defeat Satan? By the blood of the Lamb. Because we have put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ and are covered by the blood of the Lamb. And notice also, how do we defeat Satan? By the word of our testimony. That's our faithfulness. That we will give a confession about Jesus even if it should cost us our lives. That is the voice of the martyrs throughout history of the church. The word martyr if you're wondering what that means, it means witness. A martyr is a witness. And by staying faithful to Jesus, even if it costs them their lives, they're given the supreme witness of the reality of Jesus in their life. Throughout the church history, Christians have given that testimony. In fact, it still goes on in places today in this world. But what I want to focus on for our remainder of our time is the witness of the faithful in the first three centuries of the church. A particularly violent time that I think things are going to come full circle before Jesus comes again. Let's start with the Roman Empire's basic policy toward religion. I'm going to give you several points here, and you just if you want to follow along, please do. Imperial Rome was remarkably tolerant of religions in those lands conquered by the Roman army, the Roman legions. All you had to do was show loyalty to Rome. Be a good citizen. Abide by the laws. 
And Rome had no problem with you. You could worship whatever you did. Just be a loyal citizen of Rome. Unfortunately, the one thing Rome came to demand was emperor worship. This was the way Rome sought to bring loyalty and cohesion, unity, to its vast empire that ruled over a wide distance, many miles and scads of different peoples. It was their one way of bringing loyalty to the empire. Fortunately, enforcement of emperor worship was inconsistent. It, it wasn't always strongly enforced, depending on who the emperor was. So think of this enforcement and persecution as coming in waves through the first three centuries of the church. One such emperor that did enforce it was an emperor named Decius. D-E-C-I-U-S. Decius, from 249 to 51 A.D., or Christian era. Decius made Caesar worship, emperor worship, mandatory for every race and nation within the empire, with the single exception of the Jews, who they knew, the Romans knew, they would never bow to such a thing, never say such a confession, and it would be a bloodbath. And frankly, the Jews weren't a threat to the Romans. The Jews, wherever they went, just stayed in their own little enclaves, and it wasn't growing rapidly. Unlike Christianity, Christianity was growing. It was a threat because it was changing customs and traditions throughout the empire. So, what would happen when there was Caesar worship and it was enforced is that on a certain day of the year, every citizen of Rome would come to the temple of Caesar, which was in about, just about every city throughout the Roman Empire. They would have to appear before the, the temple of Caesar, burn a pinch of incense as an offering, a sacrifice to Caesar, and say three words. All they had to say was three words. Caesar is Lord. And if you said those three words, Rome was satisfied. Caesar is Lord. If you made the confession and offered the sacrifice, you were given a certificate, an actual certificate that you could go around and prove that you're a loyal Roman citizen. We're coming close to those days. But you were given a certificate documenting that you had done so. After you acknowledged Caesar as Lord, you could go away and worship any god that you wanted to worship. Rome didn't care. Just so long as you didn't break laws, you weren't disturbing the peace. But if you did not say those three words, if you did not make that oath, then you were considered a traitor to the Roman Empire. Third point, this is when Christian worship and Caesar worship met head on. The one thing that no practicing, believing Christian would ever say was Caesar is Lord. For us who follow Jesus and take Him seriously in our lives, Jesus alone is Lord. Amen, folks? We don't give our allegiance to any earthly authority. So Christians were caught in this dilemma of saying, basically, I'm a good citizen. I'm not going to break any laws. I'm going to abide by the rules of this land. But I will not, I will not say Caesar is Lord. And this brought the early Christians in direct conflict with Rome. Being a Christian made you legally an outlaw. Now, many Christians lost their lives simply because they wouldn't say Caesar is Lord. That happened. That's history. The next point, one of those early Christians who lost her life was a woman named Perpetua. Perpetua. 181 to 203 in the Christian era. She would Now get this, she was just 22 years old. Think how old, young she was. She was just fresh from childbirth, giving birth to a son, when she was arrested for being a Christian and not giving the oath. Perpetua was from noble birth. She came from a powerful family, but not powerful enough. When she was imprisoned for her faith in Christ, her father begged her to recount, 
recant, excuse me, recant her Christianity, deny Jesus just so she could be the mother to her newborn. But Perpetua said, I cannot be called anything other than what I am, a Christian. She was imprisoned. While she was imprisoned, she was baptized. On the day of her execution, she was placed in the arena with a mad heifer. Apparently, these mad heifers would just charge whatever was in there, but this the mad cow would not attack Perpetua. When the beast failed to kill her, a gladiator was sent in to finish the job. Well, the young man, he just couldn't do it. He faltered. And Perpetua herself guided his blade to her throat. In an earlier dream about her death, Perpetua said, I understood that I should fight not with beasts, but with the devil. But I knew that mine was the victory. Wow! A 22-year-old new mom who said, I I cannot deny my Lord. I think there's nothing but awesome respect for that kind of commitment, that kind of devotion. Perpetua was one of those, like so many, who did not love her life even in the face of death. Wow. That is a faith that overcomes. The next point, Emperor Diocletian lived and reigned from 284 to 320 in the Christian era. He was one of the most savage persecutors of the church. Normally when we think of persecutors of the church, we think of Nero, and he was in the first century, a madman. Nero was the one who would dip Christians into oil and then impale them on stakes and light his gardens at night. How sick is that? He was one who would take Christians and put them in the skins of wild animals and then sick, vicious, wild dogs on them and tear them to pieces. Are you kidding me? But Diocletian was even worse. Diocletian made it illegal in the empire to be a Christian. He purged his army of Christians. He ordered his officials to destroy church buildings. He prohibited Christian worship. He said, you can't meet together. Think of that. A mandate to that degree. And then he said, burn the Scriptures. Any Scriptures to be found were to be burned. Church leaders, pastors were rounded up wholesale and imprisoned and tortured, and many were put to death. It's as if the entire power of the Roman Empire was turned loose against Christianity, against the Christian community. Diocletian wanted blood. His goal was nothing less than the extermination of Christianity. But i got to tell you, by this time, the Roman citizens themselves were getting sick and tired of so much bloodshed. Honestly, they were getting tired by the third century here of coming to these arenas and watching innocent girls like Perpetua, 22 years of age, being killed and not offering any resistance. Groups of Christians coming to the arena and singing songs of praise and dying humbly. It would affect any human soul, and it was affecting the Roman citizens, and they began to protest this. But during this time of Diocletian, you need to understand, Christians were more bold than ever. People were coming forward and saying, I too am a Christian, even though they knew the consequences. It reminds me of Jesus' words in Matthew 16, 18, when Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. All the power of hell will not be able to defeat my church. You know how you make a church stronger? Just attack it and persecute it. Churches grow stronger. Well, that's what happened then. The church continued to grow and influence lives. People were willing to give their lives. It didn't matter. It didn't change anything. Eventually, because of public demand, the persecution of Christians came to an end. That and also another reason, and that is the last point I want to share. Persecution by the Roman Empire officially ended 
when Emperor Constantine came to power in 321 of the Christian era. Constantine, you may have heard of him. Years before, about a decade before, Constantine was fighting for power against a rival for the throne. When in a dream that Constantine had, he saw a a cross in the sky and heard the words, in this sign, conquer. He took that as a sign from God himself. And he achieved a tremendous victory, which he was able to eventually, led him eventually to become emperor over the Roman Empire. His soldiers from that day forward had the cross on their uniforms. From that point forward, when Constantine became emperor, he favored Christianity openly. He gave clergy tax exemption. He made Sunday, it was Constantine who made Sunday a public holiday. But as you know, by basically baptizing the entire Roman Empire into Christianity, it presented its own problems. Formalism came in, and nominalism, where people would say they're Christians, but they really weren't, it added to its own set of problems. But at least it was an open season on Christians. Persecution by the Roman Empire officially came to an end with Constantine. You need to understand that throughout those early years, whenever there was a natural disaster like a flood or a famine, crops that were dying, an earthquake that occurred, the natural tendency was to blame Christians. After all, they're the ones who are taking people away from worship of various idols. Those idols stood for prosperity. And if things went wrong, well, blame the Christians because they're the ones who are taking people away from idol worship. The gods of rain and thunder and <clears throat> prosperity. And so, whenever there was a natural disaster, the call was Christians to the lions! Blame the Christians. They became the scapegoat of the Roman Empire, but they overcame. They overcame because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. They did not love their life even to death. Wow. Folks, may we have that same courage today? Who knows what's going to happen in the future regarding our world and our own nation and where we're going? Seems like our country is doubling down more and more on enforcement and mandates. We don't know where it's going to lead in the near future, but we know ultimately where it's going because we know of the Bible, and the Bible's filled with prophecy. Think of the book of Revelation and what it tells us. We know where the future is ultimately going. Globalism talks about this confederation of nations called the beast that's going to rise up and control things. We are living in that day now where a confederation of nations, globalism, is controlling so much. A day when there's going to be centralized control, more and more mandates and dictates. We're going to live in a day soon when there's going to be attacks against Christians in Israel. And the Bible tells us there's going to come a day where there will be a loyalty oath, a mark of allegiance that is going to come. That without it, you won't be able to buy or sell. I'll have more to say about this next week. But Revelation 13 talks about this confederation of nations, this beast that's going to come upon the earth. And it's going to control in such a way that unless you give this loyalty oath, this this pledge of allegiance, as it were, to this governing system, you will not be able to buy or sell. Now, I want to be clear here. I personally do not believe the vaccines are the mark of the beast, okay? Okay. That's a decision you make whether you choose to get vaccinated or not. And I know many of you have. That's great. And you have the freedom to do that. And if you choose not to, I believe you should have the freedom not to. That is not the mark of the beast. I want to be clear whether or not you've been vaccinated. But I believe the very fact that the government can mandate it the way it is, is a precursor to this loyalty oath, this mark of allegiance. In the Bible, it's called 666. But this mark of allegiance that is going to come, 
that without it, you will not be able to buy or sell. And rather than frighten you, know this. It is a great privilege to be of the final generation. It is a great privilege if we are. I'm not saying we will, but I believe Jesus coming is soon. And what a privilege it will be to see Him come and to be raptured as a church. So whatever we may have to go through, let's go through it. Let's go through it with a strong faith, and let's go through it together, united. I don't know what exactly is going to occur, but I do know this. Dark days eventually will come, and the scope and the focus will be on the church, Christian faith, not Muslim faith, the Christian faith, and the nation of Israel. That's where it's going. That's where it's going to come. And we who know Jesus need to stand strong. This is no time to be weak in your faith. This is no time for complacent Christianity. This is no time to be wishy-washy in what you believe. This is a time to know what you believe, why you believe it, and why it's important. This is a time, I believe, to strap on and buckle up because Jesus is preparing His bride for His return. Are you ready? We'll talk about this again next week and go into it a little bit more, but we need to realize that everything is in place. This confederacy of nations, the technology to put it all together, it's all there. The attacks against Israel, the mounting tension against that small little nation in the Middle East, it's all there. All we're waiting for, really, as far as a prophetic countdown, is the appearance of the Antichrist, the man of sin. Second Thessalonians talks about that. That Jesus won't come before the apostasy, that means the departure. I'll talk about that next week. The apostasy, the denial of Christ by many, and the appearing of the man of sin. This word appearing is the same word as used for Jesus when he comes again. A sudden and dramatic appearing that's going to happen. This man of sin, the Antichrist, a world leader is not going to just be a, a politician who's worked his way to the top and finally has says, okay, here I am. Sorry, Joe, that's not going to be the way it's going to go. It's going to be a person who's going to merge on the scene dramatically, dramatically, suddenly. He may be coming in the midst of a crisis and declare that he has the answer. His message is going to be peace and safety. Peace and safety. Who doesn't want that? But death and destruction will follow in his midst. That's not craziness. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. Read 2 Thessalonians. It's going to happen. But we who know Jesus need to stay faithful. We need to stand strong and stand together for the one who gave his life for us. And so I want to encourage you to just renew your commitment Strengthen your commitment. Get into your Bible. You cannot afford to be an ignorant Christian in today's times. You need to know God and have that daily bread strengthening you on the inside for whatever you may have to face on the outside. So let's stay faithful to Jesus no matter what. Don't fear the devil. Last week we talked about how the devil roars, 1 Peter chapter 5, like a mighty lion. A lion actually can roar, and we said that it could, his roar can be heard up to five miles away. Imagine that. A lion roars, and it can be heard five miles away. Why does a lion roar? To frighten its prey, to intimidate its prey. Satan loves to intimidate us with fear, to paralyze us with fear, but we will not choose fear. We will choose faith over fear. And together we will stay faithful. Together we will stand strong. And together we will wait for Jesus coming again. That's our message. That's our ministry. That's who we are. That's what we do. So stay loyal to Jesus. Stay loyal. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want to invite you, before it's too late, to trust in Him, believe in Him, what He did for you 2,000 years ago when He gave His life for you there on the cross. And three days later, rose from the dead. He's alive today. And you can have the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of eternal life right here, right now. 
when you receive Him as your Lord and Savior, put your trust in Him. That's what's going to be so important in the days ahead, that we are prepared and ready for whatever, whatever may come. Well, folks, if you are here this week, and if you're listening to me this week, tune in next week, because we're going to talk about more about this, and look at what the Bible has to say. So until then, let's stay faithful, no matter what. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you so much that we could have this time in your word. We as Christians are not caught unaware. We're not those who give in to fear. You have not given us a spirit of timidity, of fear, and panic, but you've given us a spirit of power and love and courage, strong mind. And I pray that you would just guard our spirits, guard our souls, help us to stay faithful. So many in the past have given their lives, and they didn't want to lose their life. And yet they did because they would not deny you. That kind of courage, that kind of loyalty demands respect. And we just pray that we also would be counted faithful. And when our hour of testing comes, that we stand strong for you. Whenever it may come, however it may come, that we stay faithful to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, in your precious name. Amen.